Hello, this is a bumper eight episode of the Bat Moment with Festus Kayamo. Now, we devote this edition to make one final response to all the ignorant and mischievous statements that have been made by the desperate opposition in respect of those cadaverous documents that were recently exhumed from the United States concerning Ashiwaju Bolaame Tinubu. So, this is our final reply on this issue. And for those who make comments and documentaries without a scintilla of legal knowledge or training or even criminal practice, take your pen and paper and get some free legal lessons. One, we insist and assert that there were no criminal proceedings instituted against Ashiwaju in the United States of America in 1993 or any time at all. There was no charge or document bearing a charge number or any criminal process instituted against Ashiwaju. A criminal charge is a formal document containing one or several counts of offense or offenses allegedly committed by an accused or defendant and requiring that defendant to plead guilty or not guilty to the count or counts. There were basically five documents retrieved from the court in this case, which I have labeled documents one to five. Document one is the verified complaint for forfeiture and an attached affidavit. Document two is the interim order for forfeiture by the court. Document three is the stipulation and compromise settlement of claim by the parties. Document four is the settlement of order by the court, incorporating the terms of settlement as the order of the court. And document five is the final order of forfeiture made by the court. As you can see, the parties in all these documents are labeled plaintiff and defendants, which are terms used in civil processes and not criminal processes. Flowing from what I have just said, the number you see appearing at the top right hand corner of the document is a number for a civil process and not a criminal charge or a charge number. Similarly, what you read in either the motion for forfeiture or the attached affidavit filed in the court, making references to the suspected violations of certain criminal codes does not convert those documents to formal criminal charges. They are just mere assertions by the deponent as to his beliefs regarding what happened. As a result, no criminal indictment or conviction can emerge from a purely civil process and none was recorded against Ashiwaju. For those who are in doubt, kindly consult a very senior criminal trial lawyer and you will be further educated on this point. Again, we insist on that that Ashiwaju was not personally a defendant in all the processes filed in the courts or the orders issued by the courts. In documents 1 to 5, earlier mentioned, the parties were clearly mentioned as the United States versus funds in several accounts. Does that sound strange? Well, it is called action in REM in law. You proceed against the property and not the person. The person can then appear as an interested party to defend the property. In that case, it becomes a claimant sometimes, claiming those properties, but never a defendant. In all the documents exhumed from the US, the only two pages you see where Bola Tinubu appears as defendant is only the notice prepared by the clerk of the court to notify the owner of the account of the pending case in court against his accounts. The owner of the accounts would naturally be interested in the matter, though he's not joined originally as a party in the matter. If this confuses you, you must again seek the help of a very senior lawyer to further guide you and explain to you. We also want to insist and assert that there was no finding of fact of dealing in narcotics or even money laundering against Ashiwaju upon which a compromise settlement was reached. Firstly, in paragraph 5 of the verified complaint filed by Michael Shepard, the US attorney, it was stated that the funds represent proceeds of operation in connection with heroin or, take note of the word, or property involved in money laundering. The word or 
is so significant to show that they never came to a definite conclusion as to what the funds actually represented. It was all speculative at the point of investigation. Again, in paragraph 48 of the deposition by Kevin Moss, he also used the word or in trying to convince the court as to what the funds represented at that time. In paragraph 1 of document 3, this same word or appears again. And finally, in document 5, the word or appears again in paragraph A and paragraph J in the final order of the court. Secondly, and most importantly, the special agent Kevin Moss, whose affidavit has been providing all the ammunition for the mischief makers, admitted himself in paragraph 3 of his affidavit that he did not investigate Ashiwaju for narcotics but for tax returns. His schedule of duties was tax fraud and other financial crimes, including money laundering. In paragraph 5, he went on to say that all documents reviewed by him in the matter related only to money laundering and tax returns. In paragraph 7 and 8, he admitted that all the issues relating to drug trafficking and heroin were investigated by the DEA and the FBI and not by himself. So all those facts regarding the ruin investigation, as from paragraph 7 onwards, were merely hearsay evidence by him. And he even failed to mention the specific agents in the DEA and the FBI from whom he derived this information. In any case, though hearsay evidence in some instances are permitted in affidavit evidence, it cannot be the basis for a criminal conviction or indictment anywhere in the world. So the whole evidence of Kevin Moss in that affidavit in document one, as it relates to drug or heroin allegation, is as useless as tissue paper. Lastly, on this point, all the evidence of Kevin Moss were not subjected to the fire of cross-examination and as such has no probative value in determining the culpability or otherwise of Ashiwajo. We want to further insist and exert that the compromise settlement reached with the U.S. authority was never a plea bargain or an admission of any allegation made against Ashiwajo. I want you to carefully read paragraph 1 of document 3, which is the compromise settlement signed by both lawyers for the U.S. and Ashiwajo, and paragraph A of document 4, which is the order of the courts incorporating those terms of settlement. It is clearly stated in both documents that the claimant, which is Ashiwaju, disputes that there was probable cause to seize those funds in the first place. So Ashiwaju never accepted those allegations in any form of plea bargain. We also want everyone to take note of the timelines. In paragraph 41 of the affidavit of Kevin Moss, the initial seizure of the funds happened on January 14, 1992. I repeat, January 14, 1992, the civil motion for forfeiture was brought in July 1993, a period of one year and seven months, that is 19 months, that the U.S. investigated Ashwaju on this issue and tried to bring criminal charges against him. At the end, they gave up and rather filed a civil process to get some money from his account, which can only be the tax that they had earlier complained about in that affidavit. It is only a dumb or mischievous person that would believe that an African immigrant like Ashiwajo, if indeed he was found to be actually involved in drug trafficking, would be given a slap on the wrist in a system as efficient as this US justice system. Then he is told to take a walk with a mere forfeiture of $460,000. If you believe that, then you believe anything. There is no provision under the US laws to divide the legal money and allow the suspect to keep part of the legal money, they must take all of it. Therefore, why did the US decide to return substantial part of the money to Ashiwaju over $1 million? The simple answer is that the money returned was found to be legitimate process. It is very significant to note at this point that in document three, it was not Ashiwaju that sought an indemnity from the US. It was the US that sought the indemnity from Ashiwaju, and Ashiwaju gave it to them. Usually, in legal transactions, it is the party that feels that his conduct will be subject to further litigation 
or further inquiry that demands an indemnity. In simple terms, to a layman, the U.S. was simply pleading with Ashiwaju that the matter should not go beyond that point. Finally, we saved the best for the last. When these allegations reared their ugly heads about 20 years ago, there was a definite and conclusive answer by the U.S. government through its embassy in Nigeria. In a letter dated February 4, 2003, the U.S. government responded to inquiries on this issue and emphatically cleared Ashiwaju that he was never arrested, never tried, and never convicted for any criminal offense in the U.S. That letter was signed by Michael Bonner, a legal attaché in the U.S. Embassy in Nigeria. So, these so-called documents against Ashiwaju are nothing but a bunch of blackmail papers without any probative value, and we have dismissed them brevi manu. For those who are not satisfied, we will be glad to meet them in court instead of hawking the documents from one newspaper, from one television house or radio to the other, go to court. For now, this issue for us is closed. It is the fear of Ashiwaju at the polls that is making them run Elta Skeeter. I urge you to vote for him and vote for the APC. God bless you.